Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the next half hour, we'll make a speed run through all the key business news stories you need to know about from across the African continent, from Cairo to Lagos, Johannesburg and Nairobi. We've got you covered. Here's what's coming up. A rating cut by Moody's casts a shadow over South Africa's economic health. We'll be looking at how Ebola quarantines are hurting livelihoods, businesses and enterprises in Sierra Leone. And we'll also be looking at the growing pains of SMEs in Zambia. Let's start with Moody's, and more accurately, Moody's and what it's done in South Africa. It's cut that country's debt rating to BAA2 from BAA1, citing poor prospects for medium-term economic growth and rising public debt. Now, the move sent the rand to its weakest in nearly five weeks against the American dollar. It comes after the finance minister last month forecast a wider budget deficit for the 2014-2015 fiscal year, citing lower government revenue. However, the rating agency did change its outlook for the continent's most advanced economy to stable from negative. South Africa's government said after the downgrade it was committed to narrowing its budget deficit and it recognized the need to implement measures to boost growth, which is forecast to just 1.4 percent this year. Now, this downgrade, of course, does come as the latest blow in a series of many to hit South Africa. It's been battered by a continuous wave of industrial action, especially in the first half, severe electricity shortages, especially this week, weak consumer demand and fragile investor confidence. However, as Sumitra Naidu reports, some economists are optimistic that South Africa will pull through these challenges. South Africa is one of the most actively traded markets in the world. But labor strikes, an erratic power supply, high unemployment and a low growth forecast has put it on the back foot. Credit ratings downgrades earlier this year led to fears that it may lose its status as a top emerging market destination. There is concern within the bond market about these downgrades because as these downgrades come through, so the, the refinancing risk for the National Treasury increases. They have to issue at higher rates, higher yields, and that makes funding uh, more expensive and we know that government is already sitting with a large fiscal deficit. South Africa became the first African country to be included on Citigroup's $2 trillion World Government Bond Index back in 2012. Quite a feat for South Africa, but also important as bonds increase the flow of foreign direct investment into a country. South Africa forms a major part of a variety of bond indices. As an emerging market economy, we feature quite high up on the pile of emerging markets and a number of institutions, including Citibank, Morgan Stanley, uh, a variety of asset managers, track global indices. Government bonds are used as a development tool to fund infrastructure projects. It is a long-term investment priced at a fixed rate, which is not subject to inflation and experts are confident that South Africa remains a formidable market for such investment. We are one notch above investment grade from S&P, um, as well as Fitch, and Moody's has now got us two notches above investment grade, and we would actually have to fall um, below investment grade in two of those three rating agencies. A country needs a market capitalization of $50 billion, an investment grade credit rating, and no barriers to entry to be included on the index. But despite internal challenges, South Africa is in a better place economically than most other emerging markets. Domestic uh, concerns that we have, whilst it riddles the movement in our markets, and it is of great concern to us, uh, when compared with other emerging markets, Russia having its own set of problems, uh, China going through a slower growth phase and Brazil having a long list of issues means that South Africa still features quite high up in terms of its attractiveness as an emerging market bond destination. South Africa's finance minister and Klantler Nene has been reassuring the investment community. But with the end of the U.S. Fed's quantitative easing program and the strained power supply, the ratings agencies say they're keeping a close watch on developments. In the meantime, South Africa remains on shaky ground. Sumitra Nadu, CCTV, Johannesburg. Shaky power supplies notwithstanding. Sumitra Nadu joins us now live from Johannesburg, South Africa, for more details on this story. Um, 
So, Mitra, given the weak growth and the persistent structural bottlenecks you alluded to in your package there, poor power supply, tense relations with organized labor, today's downgrade really wasn't a surprise, was it? Not at all, Rama. The downgrade was expected, but I think many were expecting it a bit later this year. So that came as a bit of a surprise. And we saw that in the currency today, the rand fell sharply after the news came through and remains on the back foot. But yes, the economy is very weak. Debt is rising and the ratings agencies have been raising their concerns for some time now. And we saw the new finance minister, uh, Ntlantla Nene, trying very hard in his first medium term budget policy speech last month to reassure individuals investors and the ratings agencies that the problems have been identified and will be fixed. Clearly, that was not enough for them. Indeed. RMB Global Markets has argued that the RAND's weakness combined with the downgrade does give the South African Reserve Bank a bit of room to raise rates at its next MPC meeting, which is taking place on the 18th and the 20th, or rather 18th to the 20th of November. Is that a widely shared perspective? Well, yes, some economists believe the Reserve Bank should have started hiking rates much earlier this year. But of course, the Saab, with its broadened mandate, tried to hold off to help South Africans, many of whom are struggling with high levels of debt. However, the bank warned it couldn't hold off any longer. We saw two rate hikes this year, and it's widely expected there will be another hike next week, considering the RAND has weakened significantly. And also, now that the U.S. Fed has stopped its tapering program, uh, we will start seeing rate hikes in the United States soon. However, inflation has come down below the target level and oil prices have receded. Um, some economists feel like we could just escape another hike uh, at least until next year. Indeed. The Treasury, however, said that it will make, I'm quoting them here, tough decisions that are needed to make South Africa's public finances healthy once again. But just how credible is that pledge given the divisions of a policy within the ruling party itself and between the ANC and its union allies. Well, I think that remains the big question. We heard the new finance minister getting tough uh, in that budget speech last month, saying there would be some pain, government would have to cut back on spending, all vacancies to be frozen, no new appointments, no more entertainment, advertising budgets would be cut. He said all the right things. He gave a list of measures to improve the fiscus, and he was praised for making the tough decisions. But for me, though, it, it was not new. The previous minister, Praveen Gordon, warned two years ago that change Changes would need to be made to weather the storm and no one really listened and Gordon is an ANC man. He also didn't get much support from the unions. I'm not so sure whether the new minister will get the kind of support he needs within the ANC and amongst the unions at this at this point. Labor instability was one of the main issues raised by Moody's and the other ratings agencies. Indeed, we'll have to leave it there. That's Mitch and I do there live in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now then, South Africa, of course, has not really been spared from the after effects of the Ebola outbreak over in West Africa. Now, anyone with an understanding of African geography will point out that, yes, these are completely different places. But the thing is, as the summer season starts to ramp up, those individuals who are in South Africa in the tourism sector are fearing that they will have quite a problem on their hands. Here's Travis Andrews with more. Right then, let's move on to something completely different. Right at the center of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, economies do continue to bear the brunt of that is adversely, of course, affecting small and medium-sized businesses. Over in Sierra Leone, quarantines have made the movement of people particularly difficult, denying communities essential goods and services, as well as a means to acquire them. The fight against Ebola in Sierra Leone has become a personal fight. Those attempting to lead some semblance of normal life are finding it almost impossible. Mohamed Kamara is a wholesale trader in Freetown. Well, for right now, business no day. Right now, business is very difficult. Most of our bulk buyers who come from the provinces are not coming to town because their areas have been quarantined and prices are very high. Sierra Leone has seen massive economic growth since the civil war ended a decade ago. Economic forecast of an 11% rise this year has now been revised down to 8% due to the Ebola epidemic. Only two airlines are coming into the country and prices of goods have doubled or even tripled. Importation has been grounded to a halt. In fact, exportation is now virtually zero. Our mining companies have closed down, most of them. 
and most of them has gone bankrupt simply because of this Ebola virus. The World Food Program is hoping to help 400,000 people in the country over the next three months, and international aid is seen as vital. We don't have what it takes. We don't have the, the, the infrastructure. We don't have the know-how. We don't have the funds to fight this disease. And if they don't come in sooner, not only Ebola, but hunger will be the major contributing factor in killing people. 65% of Sierra Leone's 6 million people make their living from agriculture. It represents 40% of the national economy. We urge the government to enforce price controls. We are tired of prices going up every day, and if we don't sell, we don't eat. But the government has a lot on its plate already. A fifth doctor treating sick patients died from the virus earlier this week. The health service can't cope. Neither, it seems, can many of Freetown's businesses. Penina Karibe, CCTV. On to Zimbabwe now, where the president, Robert Gibral Mugabe, is urging players in the diamond industry to invest in modern tech to push the sector's production to full capacity. He made those comments while opening the second edition of the Zimbabwe Diamond Conference, and he told participants that the diamond sector needs to play a more pivotal role in the economic development of the country. Despite its mineral wealth, the exploitation of Zimbabwe's natural resources has been limited by a variety of factors. Power shortages among them, a lack of technology and market conditions are also critical issues. Mugabe told delegates at the conference that not to focus on just the extraction and sale of the diamonds, but also to consider doing beneficiation and value addition locally as well. Some experts have even predicted that Zimbabwe could hold the future of the global diamond industry. Local beneficiation and value addition of mineral commodities enhances value, resulting in more revenue for the communities, investors, and government, and in accruing additional benefits, such as employment and infrastructure development. We celebrate the fact that 99% of all diamonds that enter the market are legitimate in origin and conflict. Right then, quick run through equity markets. We mentioned the bloodbath, frankly, as going on in Nigeria with respect to its currencies and the NEC All Share Index. I was down about 3.68 percentage points uh, in trading today. Over in East Africa, however, fairly interesting developments on the Kenyan markets. The NEC had uh, Mumia Sugar having quite the sell-off. It was the second most heavily traded counter at the NEC today, quite symptomatic of the problems in the wider sugar industry in Kenya today. Coming up next, we'll be examining why Kenya maintains a ban on genetically modified food. Keep it with Global Business. Sustainable development and a commitment to developing partnerships with Africa. Some of the key phrases already used at the Africa Global Business Forum here in Dubai. There is a need for a predictable environment in which investors have to put their money. minutes into the hour you're still watching global business africa now despite repeated calls for it to be reviewed kenya still maintains a ban on the import and the use of any genetically modified organisms or foods derived from them in 2011 the then government permitted the importation of genetically modified maize familiars but it followed that fairly swiftly with a ban on all gm foods in 2012 which is still in force today now, despite that, Kenya scientists have still been hard at work developing genetically modified crops. By August 2013, genetically modified cotton was ready, and trials of maize, cassava, and sorghum were also in progress. 
Now, that 2012 ban was partly informed by a rather hotly contested, and I'm putting that mildly, study done by Professor Gilla Cirellini, which examined the effects on lab rats fed with maize, which was genetically modified to be resistant to a particular herbicide, Roundup. Kenya's Education Cabinet Secretary has described that study as being, and I'm quoting him here, widely discredited. But the ban is still in force. Why is that? Let's get some more insights now from Dr. Richard Dodor, who's a senior lecturer at the Kenyatta University School of Biochemistry and Biotechnology. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you so much. Um, what does Kenya lose by having this ban in place? Rama, Kenya stands to lose quite a bit because if you look at the situation as it is now, um, in my opinion as a scientist, first of all, our students in the university, as you are aware, all universities now, most of them that are offering science-related courses are offering biotechnology courses. Mm -hmm. Now, these students are already very anxious. They are wondering, how come that they were admitted in the university? A public but university. Public that. university, that is. And uh, they have been funded mm -hmm. by HELP mm -hmm. to do courses that are terminal in their own words. Mm -hmm. So they ask us who are their lecturers and scientists in that line. They are wondering, really, how can this happen? Well, the courses were endorsed by the government, mm -hmm. and now the kind of training, because biotechnology, largely genetic engineering, it, is part of the things that we train, and we do that pretty easily here. We've got the technology. Now, that's one thing. Kenya loses uh, a lot in that regard. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, in terms of also income, through the ports, because remember when the, bo the, the ban was mounted, yeah. um, it is not clear now whether because Kenya is a transit zone, mm -hmm. for example, the foods that are going, say, to South Sudan and or perhaps to Uganda, Uganda, to Uganda or to Rwanda, uh, to Rwanda mm -hmm. um, are largely using our land as a transit zone. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is this. We as a country are losing a lot of income because now uh, the FAO, the food agencies that sort of uh, want to help out mm -hmm. cannot use our port for purposes of, you know, transit. Mm -hmm. And therefore they are using Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So we are losing resources in that regard. Let me put an argument to you, and this comes from the Africa Biodiversity Network. One of their representatives was here in early September. They argued that genetically modified foods will not necessarily lower the cost to consumers of food um, because, in their opinion, it is a comparatively expensive solution to food security. Is there any merit to that argument? Of course there is no merit to that because we, first of all, don't have that genetically modified food here mm -hmm. commercialized for you to say, look, the costs are high. Mm -hmm. Those are all speculations, like all the demerits that they have always been citing. Mm -hmm. So it is not, it's not realistic. Then another uh, rider to that is that even now, farmers who are seriously doing good farming must buy seeds, mm -hmm. and they are not cheap either. Yeah. So the issue about cost mm -hmm. is, 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 in my opinion, no, neither here nor there, mm -hmm. because already they are buying seeds. Mm -hmm. And farmers don't mind buying good seeds, mm -hmm. so long as they'll get the yield. Speaking of yield, um, because I know you guys have been working on um, several varieties of genetically modified crops, cotton, maize, sorghum, and so on. Yeah. How do the yields compare to their non-modified cousins? They are pretty robust. And usually, uh, when scientists set out to do a research, they have to uh, get a constraint that they seek to address. What is it that you want to improve in this genetically modified stuff? We are not just enjoying sitting in the lab and doing this thing for the sake of fun. Mm -hmm. We are addressing critical issues. We have, in this country, problems with the drought. Mm -hmm. we, you have had um, nutritional problems in terms of um, malnutrition in this country. We are talking about mothers feeding their kids with cyanide containing cassava. Mm -hmm. You are talking about right now the latest kid in the block is the maize lethal, necro maize maize lethal necrosis, necrosis, necrosis disease. disease. Yeah. You know, that's the latest, and it's wiping everything, aflatoxin. Mm -hmm. So through genetic engineering, and we have this platform, in the lab at Kenyatta University, uh, I've got quite a bit of projects that are right now seeking to address the af af aflatoxin, drought, mm -hmm. um, cyanide levels, and actually, interestingly, and this is why we feel that uh, we, are, we are losing a lot as a country, we have all these transgenics in the lab at Kenyatta University. But you can't get them We, we can't get them out there because the ban is there. And that's the tricky bit. Mm -hmm. Because if they say, uh, that I can release mine because this is a Kenyan, then the, the question 
it, it starts becoming different because it now means that who makes it is not about the safety of this GM. It right. is something else altogether. One last question yes. for you, especially with regard to the context about yep. this whole GMO debate because it gained a lot of traction and a lot of heat in 2012. I'm referring here to mm. Professor Serralini's study. Yes. It was republished again this year. In your opinion as a scientist, to the flaws that were leveled at that paper the first time it was published in 2012, are they still valid today? Very valid. And I will take you through this, the, the, the story about this. When Seralini published this paper in September 2012, mm. immediately uh, Seralini is a French professor. His own government uh, commissioned what we call high councils you know, for biotechnology. It's a, an expert sort of consortium that was created by the government to investigate whether the content of that publication were you know, accurate. accurate. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the verdicts were very interesting because they, the verdict was uh, that the publication did not um, link, did not have sufficient uh, you know, basis to link tumor or cancer with, with, with the, uh, the, the, the GM sort of food. That's yeah. number one. Mm -hmm. Then number two, the problem that happened in this paper, and it's pretty, pretty um, interesting. When you do science, uh, you feed the rats with the GM, and also at the same time he used... You need to have a control group, don't yeah, you? You must have a control. That's excellent. So the control was the herbicide, and then the GM maize. Now, one thing that perhaps uh, it's very interesting, and I want to put this very clearly, is that the kind of rats that this gentleman used in his study, when you allow them to age, they develop cancer anyway. The guy does his research and allows them to age. So, so you his, don't really know whether... The way he designed <laughs> it, it had an inbuilt bias anyway. One, that's number one. Then the sample size had right. a problem. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Fascinating conversation all the same. Dr. Thank you Warren. so much. George, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. This Right, let's move on to commodity prices. Uh, with respect to oil, of course, we've been keeping tabs on this for a while. Bit of a recovery on Brent crude. 83.58 is the relevant number. Bit of a bounce. We're still keeping a close eye, however, on the OPEC meeting on the 27th of November. We'll bring you the details on that when it comes out. We'll be diving into Zambia next, looking at the challenges that small and medium-sized enterprises face in the South and African country. Welcome back to the program. Now, like many other frontier economies in Africa, Zambia's business landscape is dominated by micro, small and medium businesses. All of these are battling to grow and survive and graduate to the next level. The government is working to address this through a state-funded Citizens Economic Empowerment Commission. It was set up ideally to help SMEs get access to funding and other critical business services. CCTV's Farai Makutuya has that story in tonight's edition of Grassroots. It's another hard day at work. Lusaka is experiencing a housing boom and that has pushed up demand for steel gates, door and window frames. Business is good, but there are challenges too. I have the skills and know-how. What I am lacking is the capital to boost my business. As a result, he operates out of this makeshift warehouse right by the roadside. Good for capturing clients, but way below national safety standards. These are homemade welding machines. Some of the connections here are naked, making this quite a precarious place to work in. But these tools are getting the job done, and done well too. Big hardware shops place orders here and sell the finished product at much higher prices uptown. Failure to get funding is a widespread problem in Zambia. Traditional facilities that require collateral security have failed to yield the desired results. 
When you look at the indices of poverty and economic participation, I think there is a widespread dissatisfaction as where we are. The Citizens Economic Empowerment Commission was set up to provide loans for a growing number of self-employed Zambians, but acknowledges it will take more than just throwing money at the problem. We need to get back to uh, encouraging the mindset and developing the mindset, entrepreneurial mindset, so that people are aggressive in the way they try to engage in business and take business opportunity. A lot of things have been tried before, business competitions, this and that, and so on and so forth, but it seems to me, at least, that in the case of most African countries, especially my country, Zambia, we need something more than that. We've also got to be able to grow champions. It means that the size of the prize has to increase. The Commission says small businesses should also access appropriate technology that will make them competitive and able to penetrate markets beyond the borders. Ultimately, the vision is to develop entrepreneurs that can take up stakes in the big copper mines and cash-rich telecoms businesses that dominate the economy here. But such grand plans seem a bit far off for people like Dhaka. His immediate need is a small cash boost to enable him to move into a bigger space, buy better equipment and grow his order book. Farai Mwakutuya, CCTV, Lusaka, Zambia. So then, what exactly is in a name? Most of the time, nothing. But if it happens to be ISIS, big problem. A Belgian chocolate maker has had to change their name. Last year, they changed their name from Italo Suisse because, well, they had no connection really with either country. Now it's had to change its name again because the new name it had picked back then was ISIS. In Egypt, a woman's boutique by the same name has become a victim of hate campaign because people confuse a name with a certain notorious group over in Iraq and in Syria. Many girls and businesses in Egypt are named Isis after the mythical goddess who was actually the most powerful female goddess in the Egyptian pantheon. Isis, of course, in today's context is derived from the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. It's now associated with a fairly brutal jihadist group that arose in the wake of the Syrian civil war and has now invaded parts of Iraq. Quick run through the currencies here for you. As the week started, it does end pretty much on the same note. The Naira and the Kenyan chilling very much under pressure. The Naira, of course, the worst case of the two. We'll be keeping tabs on these currencies for you a little later on next week on Monday. That's it for this edition of the program. Send your feedback to globalbusinessafrica at cctv.com. And, of course, Facebook and Twitter are your ports of call when we're not on the airwaves. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on Monday. I'm Ramanyan.